Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you guys for having me. I know that uh, Brother Chris just had, he wasn't able to be here, so, you know, I'm glad that, uh, you know, I want to thank Pastor Shelley for extending out the invitation, but I also want to extend a thank you to you guys for having me here. I know some of you better than others. Um, I was here actually on the first, uh, on the day that it opened, I was here with Pastor Anderson and several others, and some of you I knew before then. I'm looking here at uh, Brother Travis and the Howe family, and actually it was back in 2017 when you know, he gave me a call and said, hey, I hear you're uh, soul winning out in Houston. And, uh, you know, we'd like to just plug in and get and get out. So when and I called him back, I think it was a voicemail. And I said, hey, do you want to you want to go this week or next week? And he was like, let's just go right away. And so I think that Saturday or Sunday we went out soul winning for the first time. You know, they've been a good friend of the family. And, you know, I've met Brother Nick and some of you guys either through social media or, you know, indirectly uh, or now directly. But turn your Bibles, you're there on, on uh, Isaiah 26, you're there in Isaiah 26, and the, the, the verse that we're going to focus on there is in Isaiah 26, verse 3, and verse 4, and it says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, strength. And the title of the sermon this morning is, Check Up from the Neck Up. And uh, is, is this thing on? I just want to make sure I had it. Did I need to do something we're here? No, I think we're good. Okay, I just want to make sure you guys are. And the title is a checkup from the neck up. Now, some of you might not be familiar with that term. Growing up, my generation, you know, one of the things I never thought of, we'd actually, I remember looking at older guys and they would make statements and they'd always reference back to their old days or their younger days. But I mean, eventually you actually get caught up. So now I'm the one referencing these older days. But you might not use it a lot with your kids, but I remember growing up and, you know, if you were acting a little crazy or you were doing something really dumb or stupid, you know, these older guys would come and be like, hey, man, you just need to check up from the neck up. You know, you really need to, uh, you know, another term people would say is, you know, you check yourself before you wreck yourself or something like that. You know, maybe I'm, I'm aging myself now. I'm, I'm, I'm letting you know how old I am. But those are the things we grew up with. I mean, I, on, along with that, it would be a slap upside the head. I mean, I don't know if any of you ever had one of those, but. You know, what, it, what, they, what they were referencing was the fact that you need to examine your thoughts. You know, you've heard the, the, the statements, think before you speak, or, you know, just how do you want to process yourself? And the thing that I want to focus on today is I'm not going to really bring anything new, but more, more importantly, I'm going to reinforce things that you've learned in the past from the Bible. And I want to just, you know, edify you and leave you with the fact that we need to guard our minds because our minds are... You know, they're the like the foundation of how we act, you know, now we I could get real deep into something about like the conscious and subconscious. And I thought about that. And I was like, no, we'd, we'd get real long. But, you know, one of the things that you want to do as you prepare every day is you want to examine yourself and really not just yourself physically. I mean, obviously, the, the body's just going to get old, but the Bible says that the mind is renewed. You know, as we get older, our bodies. How many in here have aches and pains in the morning? I don't brace your hand, but I start having them. You know, I mean, it just comes with age. I played a lot of sports when I was young. I have a torn tendon that I won't go to surgery for. I have a couple of broken ankles. I have a messed up finger. You know, those things eventually are. But you know what you can do? Your mind can stay renewed every day. Amen. And you can stay focused on the Word of God. And so, you know, we see that there, and it says, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. That word stayed just means you rely, you're focused completely on Jesus Christ, on the word of God, right? And he says, because he trusteth in thee, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. You know, now one of the things I love about the Old Testament is how much it references Jesus Christ. You know, the more you read the Bible, the more you see that in there. But, you know, just a couple of things, just so you know, uh, that word mind comes up 92 times, or it's in 92 verses in the Bible. We're not going to go through all of those today, by the way. Just, but the Bible does speak a lot about your mind, and it, and it references it in different in different formats. We'll talk about it here in a, uh, in a little bit. And like I said, I'm not I'm not here to preach anything new. By the way, if anybody's preaching anything new, real real new, then you might not want to listen to them anyways. Right. Now it might be new to you, and that's okay. But if it's new to everybody, you might not want to be behind the pulpit ever again. I mean, I'm just letting you know that those things that do exist out there and, you know, being that you're part of this church and your pastor uh, is Pastor Shelley, you know, the drama that comes with, you know, pastors that preach hard and that are telling the truth. 
And so you're going to hear a lot of new doctrines, and I'm pretty sure you've already experienced some of that in the last two years. Not, I'm not pretty sure. I am sure that you've experienced that. You know, I've, I've, you know, you, if you have social media and you just click in there, even if just once or twice, you're going to see all the drama that comes with it. Which, by the way, you know, people complain. Let me just make a side note about how much drama there is, for example, in the new IFB and in churches like this. Have you ever turned on the TV or been somewhere and just listened to, you know, the news? I mean, that's all it is, is drama. Reality TV. I mean, I grew up watching TV. That's all it was. I mean, have you ever seen a telenovela? I mean, talk about drama. This is like nothing compared to some of that stuff. So, you know, that complaint, you should go out the window. But, And then the goal today is just to show you from the Bible that we can be bold and confident if it is based on God's Word. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's a difference between being arrogant or prideful and being bold and confident. But the confidence has to come from God's word. See, I know that he's going to keep his promises. So I can say that with confidence and boldness. You know, and I know that God's word is true. I can say that. But if I start telling you what I think with boldness and confidence, but it's not really God's word, well, then that might be, that is pride and arrogance, right? And so we just need to stay focused on that. But in order to do that, we need to have a checkup from the neck up. You know, today's the 17th. So by now, most of you have broken your resolutions and your goals and all that. And what you did today, though, maybe some of you, I know I've done in the past, I'm always guilty of that, is what you do is you count and there's 15 days left in January, so you're like, man, I'm just going to close it out strong in 15. But the challenge is that, you know, you're going to fail with the goals, you're going to fail with, the, with the, the resolutions if you're not focused on the fact that you've got to re-examine yourself. And failure is part of life. You're going to do that. I mean, I fail, you fail. The Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You've got to learn how to pick yourself up. But it's not just, and let me be careful here. I'm starting to sound a little bit like maybe motivational, but I'm going to clear that up in a little bit. You want to motivate yourself, but you want to motivate yourself in the word of God. You know, one of the things that I had to be very careful with when I started preaching was getting rid of the old man. You know, I grew up, my dad wanted me to be a motivational speaker. And so, I mean, I've read and listened to hours upon hours of Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar and Brian Tracy and Tom Hopkins. I mean, I can just go down the list. I have books and books and books. I probably need to burn them all. But in the movie, you know, I've just never gone through them. They just sit there in the closet. But, and so you got to be careful because the challenge is you don't want to be in a self-improvement or even a self-destructive state in life. You know, and I don't, I'm going to touch on that here. And by the way... I encourage you to be here tonight because technically tonight's sermon is kind of building up on this morning's sermon. Even though it's not a two-parter, it kind of worked out like that. But, you know, one of the things that we've got to look at is this thing of the mind. You know, how people look at it. You know, the, the, the I forget the name of it and I should have written it down. But the DMS is what it's called. And it's the, the book where they diagnose me- mental disorders. I forget the technical term. It's diagnostic of mental syndromes or disorders, right? Or, I'm sorry? Diagnostic and statistical manual. There's a diagnostic and statistical manual. But the one thing that you want to know is I wanted to look at the history of when they started, attack, like, uh, I, bet, I guess, diagnosing mental disorder, right? Because one of the things that we've seen as of late, I remember back in like 2013, I was the chief of staff here in the city of Houston for a council member. And one of the things that we would do is vote on uh, you know, just different expenditures for the city for, you know, services and utilities and the police and whatever. And one of the things that they would uh, well, actually every week, there was hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars being spent on mental uh, wellness or mental illness or mental this or mental that. And what the world's trying to do is convince you that you're going crazy. That's really what they're trying to do. They're trying to convince you that you need to depend on the government for your mental health. Right. And what we want to do is depend on God for our mental health. Amen. Right. But let me just tell you here. It's a real quick. I'm going to read this out, out loud for you of, uh, you know, where they got this idea of mental health. And it's kind of interesting. As we lead into as we lead into this uh, mental checkup, but it says progress in the treatment of mental illness necessarily implies improvements in the diagnos- diagnosti- uh, diagnosis of mental illness. A standardized diagnostic classification system with agreed upon definitions of psychological disorders creates a shared language among mental health providers and aids in the clinical research. While diagnoses were recognized as far back as the Greeks, it was not until 1883 that German psychiatrist uh, Emil Kraplin uh, published a comprehensive 
that's a, by the name, it is crap. I mean, it was, published a comprehensive system of psychological disorders that centered around a pattern of symptoms, suggestive of an underlying psychological cause. Other clin clinicians also suggested uh, popular classification systems, but the need for a single shared system paved the way for American Psychiatric Association's 1952 publication of the first diagnostic and statistical manual. So there it was, you know. Um, but you see that that's only been since 1952. And the reason that I thought this was interesting is this guy, e, uh, Emil Kraplin or Kraplin, however you pronounce it, was kind of overshadowed by Sigmund Freud and a bunch of these other uh, uh, fathers of psychology. But this is the guy they picked to write this book. And the reason they picked this is because the way that he would uh, manage this was like a project manager. And so it allowed them to be able to add more things to this book so they could classify more people with mental disorders. You know, just basically drug everybody is what they're trying to do. And the DSM has undergone, you know, various revisions, like 1968, all the way to 2013. And it's in 1980, the DSM uh, uh, three version that began a multi-axial classification system that took into account the entire individual rather than just specific problems. And so basically it just goes on to tell you how they're they get to this information, right? And what's interesting is there's a sub note when I was doing this research, and it says up until the 1970s. So who, who here might have been born in the 70s? All right, right there, one. I was born in 1980, so just 10 years before I was born, homosexuality was included in the DSM as a psychological disorder. Because that's what it is. You know, the Bible actually tells us they're reprobate, right? It says, thankfully, society and clinical understanding changed and recognized it recognized it didn't belong. So see, the thing is, we need to focus and stay on God's word because the world's going to tell you, you know, notice the wording, thankfully. What they're trying to tell you is they're trying to sympathize with this wicked disorder. Right. You know, the challenge nowadays is one of the big attacks that we're going to see is not from the world. We expect that from the world. It's from within. And they'll use terminology like this where they use kind of like, very positive reinforcement terminology to, to promote something very negative. And so we have to be very careful with this. And so the world and, you know, the, the false prophets will have, make you, have you think you're crazy. I mean, they really do. Think about it. I mean, just turn on the TV today if you wanted to. And I don't, I mean, but I guess maybe I'm dating myself. You can, I guess people don't, do people even watch TV anymore? I think they just watch like YouTube and social media and Facebook Live or whatever. I don't, I, you know, we, we grew up, I was telling my wife, she didn't even know I was, I was telling her, I, was, I, I remember when the first uh, big flat screens came out, you know, they take up like this whole pulpit right here. And, you know, there was no such thing as like a flat screen um, anyways. And if it was, it was like, you know, your entire room. But and so the thing is, we need to learn to stay on God and God's word to combat the evil. So turn your Bibles over to um, let me just. Yeah, turn your Bibles over to Psalm. Turn your Bibles over to Psalm 71. But the first thing, the first point I want to give you is, you know, the bio, do we want confusion or clarity? When we're taking a look at the way we think about things, what is it doing in our minds? Is it creating confusion or is it creating clarity? Now, some things in the Bible are easier answered than others. But, but what you need to do is trust or rely on God's word. See, I love the word of God. And even when it all doesn't always make sense to me, I'm going to rely on God's word that it's going to be the right thing for me 100% of the time. And so it has to be clear that I'm going to lean on this regardless of what's going on around me and what other people say is or should be the norm of society. And so we have to make sure that it's not a confusing issue, right? The Bible tells us there in 1 Corinthians 14.33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And then it ends, 1 Corinthians 4, 14, 40, it says, let all things be done decently and in order. So, you know, in order to have clarity, you want things to be done decently and in order. What's interesting about that chapter is that's the chapter that deals with speaking with tongues. And by the way, tongues is just speaking another language. For those that speak Spanish, it makes sense, right? Because it's uh, tu lengua nativa, your native tongue. You know, that's, that's how we... So it doesn't, it's not weird to us. Well, maybe some charismatic Hispanic, but those guys are just crazy, right? And, uh, and then the, at the end, it closes with leadership in the church, right? In 1 Corinthians. And it tells you like the order, you know, how the men are supposed to lead in the church. 
and women are, remain silent. All these things right here. And then Leviticus 18.22, you know, I'm just giving you a couple of verses that deal with confusion. You don't have to turn there, but it says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down thereto. It is confusion. So see, I mean, if it's confusing, then it's not of God. It's pretty simple, right? Psalm 71.1, and if you want to follow with me, we're going to be in James and then Revelation, because I'm going to move pretty quickly through these. But Psalm 71, verse 1 says, In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. So look, if you're confused about an issue, then you need to get in the Word of God. You need to get in church. You need to get in with good fellowship. I mean, you think about why the world is so confused. I always think of it from, a, you know, I've run several businesses in my life. And one of the things that you do is you've got to run statistics all the time, right? You're always running numbers. Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? But look, if you look at a church and you look at their, for example, their youth, well, the youth is spending 80, 90 percent of the time in like the public pool system getting brainwashed. And then they go to you know church maybe three hours a week. And I'm not talking about this church. I'm just talking in general. That's how we all grew up, right? Where's the balance? Who's getting, who's getting the upper hand? And then you wonder why your kids go off to college and they come back a bunch of liberals with a bunch of weird ideas. Well, you know, that's what you've been feeding them, the mind. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit. But it says there in verse 2 of Psalm 71, it says, Deliver me in thy righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me and save me. Be thou my strong habitation whereunto I may continually resort. Continually means like constantly, right? You don't want to just do it once. See, the challenge is people come to church on Sunday. Catholics are famous for doing that, right? They'll go to church on Sunday and they do all the good things and then the rest of the week, they're just, you know, messing up everywhere. And the Bible says, Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. So who's delivering you from the confusion? God, you've got to stay on his word. Amen. James 3, verse 13 says, Who is a wise man and dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The wisdom, This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. Right? It says, but the wisdom that is far from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. But we can't make peace if we're not stayed on God. He says he keeps us in perfect peace. Revelation 21, verse 22, says, and I saw no temple therein. I love this part. It says, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it, and there shall be no wise... <coughs> Enter into anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but that which is written in the Lamb's book of life. And then you, you read over Revelation 22, because it's speaking of Jesus, you know, it's speaking of, of this revelation. It says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, crystal clear as crystal, proceeding out of the th throne of God and of the Lamb. You know, the very first thing that we always emphasize and it's I was talking to, you know, Pastor Cobb last week at our church, and I told him, you know, one of the things that we're going to have to enforce more and more is a clear gospel message. I mean, seriously, the more that these attacks come, the more that the world goes into wickedness, the more we have to emphasize a clear gospel message. Right. Because people are looking for leadership, so they're actually turning to Christianity, but they're not turning to God's word, and they're not turning to salvation. They're looking to their works. Yeah, you know, I mean, I saw something the other day about, 
uh, and, and here I go dating myself again, but I mean, I grew up watching wrestling. I'm sorry, I, mean, I got saved when I was 25. Don't do it, kids. But I did, you know, and, and one of the, the, the wrestlers that was famous at the time was The Undertaker, which, by the way, if you think about how evil, it nothing to do with Christ but all his works. It was a lifestyle evangelist. I mean, really, I, I listened to it for, it was a seven-minute clip about how his life got changed. There's no Christ in it. There's no believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just all about me, 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 me. Right? And that's what the world's looking at. But if you look there, it, what's interesting is, in, in, and by the way, turn to Matthew 6. Matthew 6, I'm almost done with these verses on this first point. But John 4, 14 says, But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing, springing up into everlasting life. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And, the, and then in Revelation 22, 17 says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that hear it say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. I like that because in Revelation 21, 22, 1, it says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. You know, that's, where, that's probably where we get the term crystal clear. Yeah. We need to have a crystal clear message. Amen. You know, if you were to talk to Seventh-day Adventists today, they'll tell you that they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They will. I've had those arguments. By the way, don't argue with people. Just walk away. I mean, but I've had them. I mean, unfortunately, you learn, right, as you get older. But they'll tell you that. And they'll tell you it's on Jesus Christ and it's not of works, not Jesus that it's all Jesus did until then you read what investigative judgment is. I'm not going to go too much into it, but basically it's where God is, uh, Jesus is justifying your works before God at the end times. So that's, not, that's not a clear gospel message. There's nothing that can get us into heaven but a clear gospel message, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. The only reason we're going into heaven is not because of us, it's because of Jesus Christ. So we have to be clear, but it's not just on the gospel message. It's on anything we do in our life. And I thought about it. I was going to give a bunch of points about, you know, what could be confusing and clear. But the reality is there's so many topics. But we, we can touch on the basic ones, right? I mean, we touched a little bit. The Bible's very clear. Look, God made them male and female. There's no confusion there. It's clear. Right? God made that we have, we're natural sinners, but then there's unnatural sin. That's pretty clear. And we need to be able to discern not only for ourselves, but for our families. You know, we need to be able to have that checkup from the neck up. And it is, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you're not going to experience confusion, but there is an answer, but the answer is not calling your friend or looking for someone to justify what, what you're thinking. It's whatever's clear in the Word of God. And you know, sometimes when God clears it up for you, you don't always like the answer God gives you. Right? I mean, that's the reality. And what happens is the reason you're doing that is because what you're trying to do is justify that confusion. So you really need to be committed to staying on the Word of God. You really need to be committed to walk in that straight and narrow. And so anyways, uh, you're there in Matthew 6. And so there's a, just three things that I'm going to leave you with that affect the mind. The first thing is what we see. What are we putting our vision on? And I'm literally talking about what we're looking at. See, I'm looking out today, and I see women dressed as women, men dressed as men. You know, I don't see anybody, anything too crazy. If you go to the modern churches or the contemporary churches, it's wild. I mean, I don't even, it's, it's crazy. As a matter of fact, I'd rather listen, you know, if I'm trying to do some research on, you know, these contemporary churches, I'll just listen to the clip. I can't even stand looking at these guys, you know? <laughs> Seriously, they wear, uh, I, I didn't even know that was a thing. Apparently, a t-shirt now is like, it, it's all the way down, it looks like a skirt. <laughs> Who wears that? I'm serious. I mean, that's weird. I mean, I'm talking about the guys doing that, right? I've seen women that do that, right? They they wear these long shirts, it's like a dress shirt. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I'm not, I don't have... I don't know enough about that, so forgive me about that. That's good, right? But what we see, you know, vision, and I just, I, look, I was looking up, you know, about the eye, and obviously you can get real deep into it, but the only thing that I'm going to tell you about is the vision is thought to require to use about half of the brain's neural pathways. I mean, half of them. If you know anything about the brain, the neural pathways are in the billions, right? It says, uh, and obviously this is someone who studies this, 
So your mind is affected by what you see more than you think. You know, what are, remember, you know that, remember if you ever went to church with a Sunday school, be careful little eyes what you see, you know, what you're putting your mind on. In, in, in Mexico, we, we had a commercial, mucho ojo, you know, just be careful, like, and so you got to be careful what you put in your mind. My dad, you know, one of the things, we didn't grow up, obviously, Christian, but one of the things my dad always taught me was he would never let me say negative things because he's like, what you say or what you think, you're going to make it a reality. Now, there's a way to focus on God, let me, but he also would tell us to be very careful what we put our eyes on. He's like, what you feed your mind, you know, garbage in, garbage out. You want something good to come out, you better start feeding that mind. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, right? But the, the mind feeds it. Your eye feeds it. Matthew 6, 19 says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break in through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Pay attention, the light of the body is in the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And I think it's interesting that it ends in that because that's really what it comes down to. Like, you know, you're self-glorifying yourself. I mean, what do we call people like that? That are It's all about me. They're narcissists, right? And a narcissist cares about what he looks like. Let me just tell you that, first of all, right? I mean, we get that from the, 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 the uh, Greek mythology, I think. And they, supposedly that guy, narcissist, loved himself so much that he wanted to marry himself. That's, how, that's why we get that term narcissist from, right? You think people love themselves today more so than God? I mean, just just go downtown or somewhere that's like popular, and you'll see people just all day. I think it's so weird. Like I, th to me, it's even strange just trying. You know, you're trying to promote stuff. You're trying to promote the church, and it's weird just making a video. I remember actually, uh, brother Travis helped me make the first video for the Soul Winning Mega Marathon. Remember how hard it was because it was just weird. He was filming me, and I just felt weird behind the camera. But man, but people love, I mean, there's some people that are real natural at it, right? They just love being behind the camera all the time. You know, it's just, it, it's just this constant feeding. But the other thing is, what's the other thing? Lay not up for yourself treasures on earth. What are people doing? They're just always coveting what they can't have. The reason that celebrities are famous is not because they're great people. It's because people want what they supposedly have, right? The nice car, the nice jet. And, nice whatever. and their lives are crap. Most of them die. Most of them are on drugs, kill themselves. And then, and then they make this big hula and celebrate what? Their eternal death? I mean, it's actually a really sad state. Turn over to Luke 11, and in verse 33 says, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, put it in a secret place, neither under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that they which come in may see the light. The light of the body is the eye. Look, how do we read the Bible with our eyes? I mean, I, I know maybe I'm being oversimplistic today, but that's the reality of the thing, right? I mean, I know we can listen to it, but the majority of the time we're reading our Bibles. How much time are you spending in the Word of God? It says, therefore, when thine eye is single, the whole, thy whole body is also full of light. But when thine e eye is evil, thy body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. Take heed. There, that, there's that checkup. Make sure that your body, that, you, that it be not darkness. If thy whole body, therefore, be full of light, having no part dark, the whole shall be full of light. And when the bright shining, as when the bright shining of a candle doth give thee light. You know, I thought about this, and, and, and this is actually not part of the message, but I thought about this last night. You know, remember Jesus talks about how if they hate us, it's not us that they hate, it's Jesus, right? right. Well, if we're, sh if we're shining light on a hill, have you ever been blinded by a light? You can't see the person that's blinding you with a light. That, that's why police officers use that, or sometimes that's a self-defense thing. You know, you have a, a, a bright light, because it's really hard to see the, the image behind the light, right? 
That's how we should live our lives. They shouldn't see us. They should see Jesus. You know, I just thought about that. You, if you blind them with your light, it's the light of Jesus Christ. But then they're going to hate you. Just know that. I mean, just be okay with the fact that people are going to... You know, people don't like you anyways. I'm just telling... I'm going to tell you straight up that people don't like you anyways. You need to have good fellowship. And even in a church like this, people are going to backstab you. People are going to just leave you hanging. They're going to disappoint you. They are. Life is tough. You know, I don't understand why people have such a uh, animosity to Christ other than what the Bible says. I mean, the Bible is very clear that they hate Christ just because he's Jesus Christ, because he's the light of the world and the devil hates him. But as far as human logic, it doesn't make any sense. I mean, we're not out hurting people. We're not out looking to destroy anybody, but that's how they're going to attack us, right? From a, from a carnal viewpoint, it doesn't make any sense why they would do that. But that's what the Bible says. But you know what? what's even more interesting is they're kind of bothered by the fact that people go to church and people are like, well, there's a bunch of hypocrites there. Have you ever lived that life? You know, I, I lived 25 years of my life before I was saved. And then I've lived now, what, 20, 40 to 25? Somebody do the math for me, but it's like 15 years saved, you know? And let me tell you what, there's no difference as far as how people act towards you. The only thing that's different is that I have the peace that passes all understanding. People are going to backstab you. People just treat you. That's just human nature. The Bible says for all have sinned. We know this. And people try to act like Christianity is some kind of uh, scourge of society. And if that's the case, then so be it. I'd rather live this life for Christ than the one that I left that previously. You know, just. Amen. But what we put in our mind, what we see does affect the way we, we reflect Christ. And it does. You know, that's the challenge of being an older preacher, you know, that started later in life. So I've got a lot of crap in my mind that I've got to sponge out. So I've got to really get in the Word. I mean, seriously. Think about all the things that we just grew up watching. You know, our parents didn't think anything of it. I mean, I don't even, I'm not going to, just even just the cartoons we watched and the movies we watched. And the average, I mean, it's only gone up. I remember back then that the average was like three or four hours that kids would spend on TV after coming home from school. Multiply that by seven. 30 hours a week watching TV. That's a part-time job. I mean, some people. <laughs> that, I mean, think about the investment that you put. You know, What are you teaching your children? How are you changing their lives? So be careful what they see. Be careful what you see. And I know it's very simplistic. I mean, I remember I'd get annoyed with my dad, but it, it, it's actually not as simplistic as you think. And the older we get, the harder it is. There's certain places that I just don't go anymore. There's certain things I'd rather not do because there's certain family members I can't be around because of the way they dress. I just don't want to be in that situation. I mean, seriously. You have to be careful. And are we perfect at it? No, but we can constantly be improving. We need to check up. And it's daily, right? Though you, you guys that are older will know this. And, and I know I keep harping on age, but I'm just, there's certain things that we used to do when we were older. Remember having a, you'd go on a trip, you had to what? Check your car. Cars are so good now, you don't, you have to check the oil and you have to check the tires and you have to make sure it wasn't going to break down on you. I had a, my first car was a 1989 Escort. And I mean, I remember one time it broke down on me. I had to push it up a hill right off of a 35, right there be, before a, uh, Buda or whatever, Buda or whatever it's called, uh, between Austin and, and San Antonio. And there's a big old, and I had like three or four guys who were pushing that car up because we didn't check the oil and then the car seized. I mean, it's just, you've got to check these things. If not your car, your mental, your mind's going to see. And we know that the Bible, you know, God can punish you by making you go crazy. I think that's what's going on right now with the world. I mean, look who our next president's going to be. That's if there's not a coup, right? We don't know what's going to happen. But either way, both presidents are nuts, right? Uh, either one. I mean, it just makes sense. But So the first thing is what we see. What, what are we putting our eyes to? What are we looking at? And sometimes it can be real subtle. It's not that difficult to get caught in the weeds. Second thing, what we think. What are you thinking? What are you putting your mind to? In Genesis 6, turn to Genesis 6, verse 5, it says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination 
of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I mean, what are our thoughts? They are affected by our mind. In verse 6 of Genesis 6, 6, we know it says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the earth, for it repented me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Makes me think, what was Noah thinking? Because it says the imaginations of the thoughts of their heart. But Noah was spared with his family. So Noah was, and that's how it's going to, that's how we feel sometimes, right? It's just, it's just us. That's why it's good to come to church and have that fellowship. So you're reminded that you're not the only one that hasn't bowed the knee to Baal. Because when you're out at work and when you're out with your family, that's how it feels. I mean, at least with me, that's how it feels. You know, when I go, I mean, I don't even talk to my dad's side of the family anymore. I got two sodomite uncles, right? And then the other uncles and aunts, they support them, so there's no way I can be around that. I mean, it's just, after I had kids, that's when I stopped. I don't want my children around that crap. I mean, seriously. It's disgusting. Do you know what people get out of this sermon that aren't, you know, like-minded? Oh, he said crap. I've had people get on to me for saying crap behind the pulpit. Not the fact that I have two sodomite uncles that we got to be careful for. Forget that. You know, how can you say that behind the pulpit? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I don't know what you want me to say. Psalm 94. In the meantime, just turn over to 1 Peter. I, I got a couple of verses here, but go to 1 Peter 3. Psalm 94, the Bible says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of man. Look, you're not going to hide your thoughts from God. That they are vanity. So see, this is what I'm talking about. We need to rely on God because you can't even rely on yourself. Look, if you think that you can figure things out, you're not. The Bible says, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of man that they are vanity. So even your thoughts are vanity unless they're stayed on God. Seriously. I mean, I don't, let's not have that conversation. It says the thought of foolishness is sin, the Bible says. You think foolish things all the time. Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law, that thou mayest give him rest for the days of adversity, until the pit be digged for the wicked. He didn't say give you rest, just period, from the days of adversity, right? Of the days of adversity. For the Lord will not cast off his people, neither will he forsake his inheritance, but judgment shall return unto righteousness, and, uh, and, the, uh, and all the upright in heart shall follow it. Proverbs 12, 5, you're there in First Peter, but... Proverbs 12, 5 says, The thought of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are de- uh, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. Proverbs 15, 26 says, The thoughts of the wicked are an abomination to the Lord, but the words of the pure are pleasant words. Well, where do we get our pure words? From the word of God. And I wasn't going to tie it on purpose, but it just worked out. I mean, we're in the right place, right? But there is a purpose behind that name. There is a purpose behind our life, living it like that. Proverbs 16.3 says, Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. See, the problem is we rely too much on what we're thinking. Who's establishing your thoughts? Jesus Christ. Proverbs 21.5 says, The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plentiness, but of everyone that is hasty, only to want. I mean, to be diligent, that means you've got to work at it. You can't just wake up in the morning and you're on social media and drinking your coffee and checking the news and replying to emails. You haven't spent time with God and then you expect like you're, you're going to have perfect thoughts. Then you end the day and you're like, God, why did, why did I get in a fight with my wife? Why am I thinking revenge on so-and-so? Why am I so angry at this? Why am I so bitter at that? Why am I... How much time did you spend on it? Amen. You're putting your thoughts and your mind on the wrong things. You're getting the wrong results. And then the last thing, how do we respond? You know, my dad, actually, I'll give him, I'm giving my dad a lot of credit today, but as far as what the foundation, and I think that's what helped me get, uh, you know, saved, because he, he taught me, he, he was very good about teaching me to think. He's like, don't react, respond. You know, react, that's, that's where we end up making mistakes, right? If you react, the reaction is when somebody pushes you, and you just punch them back right away. That's the natural reaction of a guy, right? You push me, I'm going to punch you back. 
But the Bible says to turn the other cheek. So if someone pushes me, now i got to learn to respond. Just hold my peace. Amen. Now, if you're defending your family, that's a whole other thing. But you personally, you better take it, right? Go to your first Peter. But Colossians 4, 5 says, Walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. But you can't learn how to answer every man if you're not in the Word of God. You know, one of the things I, you know, it's in the bulletin is your memory verse. It's great. Get a memory app. Read your Bible so that you know how to respond to people. From the Word of God. You know, one of the mistakes you make as a new Christian, or maybe if you're not, that's good, don't make it. But you get into arguments, you want to prove to people how much you know, and you're trying to lead them to Christ, and you just get into this. And what ends up happening is, who takes over? You do. And then you lose that ability to lead that person to Christ. But also, you also lose the ability to, to argue with other people too, because you end up arguing with people that you shouldn't be arguing with. Stop wasting your time with the world. Other than when you're leading them to Christ. You know, go so winning. Do that. Preach the word of God. Invite people to church. Make sure you're in church. But don't argue the rest of the stuff. Everybody's worried if there's going to be a coup or not. And I'm not saying don't be in the news. You should know what's going on. But don't let it affect your life. If Trump stays as president or if Biden becomes the president, how is it going to affect your life? You're going to stop soul winning? You're going to stop reading your Bible? You're going to stop standing up for Christ? I mean, you better be prepared. You know, I heard this recently, and I think it was um, actually Pastor Anderson, but I liked it very much, was... And I didn't know that my, my, my dad had kind of, I never thought about it in that term, but that's what's something that I've done in my life is you got to think, okay, what would happen if this happened? And he, he had mentioned about the fact that he had decided a long time ago how he was going to respond or think before it happened so that when the time came, he, he didn't have to think about it. Because what happens in a time of, of tumult or panic or, or stress or anxiety? You let your emotions take over, and then what you do, you make an emotional decision. And the reality is we shouldn't make emotional decisions. We should make emotions based on the Word of God. Right? I mean, so think about these things. Do a checkup from the neck up. I mean, spend some time saying, what would happen if Biden becomes president? I mean, maybe you already know the answer. Or what would happen if, if there is a coup and we become a socialist or communist country with a dictator? I mean, seriously, what would happen... If all that, what would happen if you get thrown in a FEMA concentration camp? <laughs> right? But I mean, think about it. Even if it were to happen, what would you do? Is it the end of your world or are you going to preach the word of God? Right. How much scripture do you have memorized? I'm, I, I don't actually think that that's going to happen. Um, I think that that's been, been sold to us so that we can just spend our time worrying about things that we can't control anyways. And I, the reason I tell you that is because, I mean, I was there on Google Maps 20 years ago when they had all the caskets in Georgia, you know, on the, by the trains. Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I've experienced that, and it doesn't do you any good. You just, it's what I'm saying. What are you feeding your mind? What are you looking at? What are you thinking? How are you responding? First Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Having a good conscience, that's the, the key that I want to put. Having a good conscience. You can't have a good conscience without Christ. We know there's other verses that says God seared their conscience. So God controls, you know, he, he knows our thoughts. It says that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better, if the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. It's better that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. I mean, that's, that's a response, not a reaction. Because your, your reaction is, when things get tough, you just go back in that little hole. That's why that saying is so popular, right? There we go with another saying. When the, when the things get tough, the tough get going. Look, just recently, well, let me finish the verse real quick, and then I'll, I'll tell you. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. 
By the way, I think there's been a controversy about whether God, Jesus Christ was put to death. Maybe they weren't reading their Bibles. Right? right? That's why you need to have that clarity of confusion. That's why you need to know if you're clear on things or if you're confused on things. And if you're confused, get in the Word of God. Amen. But you need to know how you're going to respond. Right? Just recently, uh, you know, basically my business got turned upside down right at the end of October, you know, and it was business that I've spent four or five years building things. You know, one of the reasons that it got turned upside down is, I mean, I verified this now because I've heard it from other sources. The client, my biggest client basically decided that he didn't like me anymore, even though he's making the most money he's ever made in his life. And now I know that it's, he's been going around telling people that I'm a preacher of hell. So I know why he doesn't like me because I've actually given him the gospel and I'll stand on the word of God. It's okay. I like that. The Bible says, but you got to know how you're going to respond is the point I'm trying to make. I'm not telling you this so you feel sorry for me. It doesn't matter. Life's going to happen. What I'm telling you is I committed that I was going to serve God no matter what in my business. So if my business goes awry, it doesn't matter. God's going to look. He's promised that he's going to provide for me. So it doesn't matter. Either that, either I'm leaning on the promises of God, or I'm not. And I mean, you've got to try your faith like that, right? You've got to be able to respond to the situation that come ahead. Because, look, you guys are a good church. I was here day one. This is a church that's grown. It's a lot. There's a lot more people here than the first day I was here. I mean, I mean, the very first day was a lot of people, but you know, you had special guests. But after that, you know, it's just grown the way that you're going to get attacks. You are. You've been attacked. You're not going to get attacked. You've been attacked. And I learned this from an, I did learn this from an old IFB preacher, but he preached a sermon one time, you know, on how Jesus was tempted and he was, te- you know, after the third temptation, that key word it says, and then he left for a season. And he always pointed, that always stood out to me. You know, the devil will, will flee. If you resist the devil, he'll flee. But it's always for a season. He's going to come back. So don't think that that trial you got through, oh, now it's easy sailing. It's just around the corner. It's just the next day or the next week or the next hour. For all you know, you walk out of here and you're going to get some news. you got to know how you're going to respond. You know, you got to know how you're going to think about these things. And so let's just go ahead and just recap real here, real quick. You know, you want to have that perfect peace. Isaiah 26.3 says, that will keep him in perfect peace. That will keep him in perfect peace. Whose mind has stayed on thee. Because he trusts in the. I mean, these are famous verses that people like to use all the time, but I don't know that we, you study them out in context. I mean, relying on God is a serious thing, right? The Bible says it's like a, you know, that we ought to be like his children, right? He says, little children, when your babies rely on you, they, they're completely reliant on you. You know, your six month old is not going to feed himself or herself anytime soon. Let me just tell you that. <laughs> And if they do, it's not going to be the way you thought it was going to be, right? They're not going to change their own diapers. They're not going to, you know, tell you that they're sick. They're not going to tell you that they're uh, fuzzy. They're not, you've got, they rely completely on you for that information. We've got to have that. We've got to understand. I mean, God is the everlasting God. I mean, even if we grow up, he still sees us as just little children. I mean, think about it. The, just the vast... I, you know, I'm I'm 40, my oldest is four. There's a 36, 37 year gap. There's no way on God's green earth that she's ever gonna, like I'm never gonna look at her like she's got this, there's a big gap. Like there, 36 years later, I'll have 36 years more knowledge than she will again. You know, I mean, just constantly when she's catching up, that think about God, he's everlasting. We're never within even the realm, right? We're never even close. But yet we walk around like we think we are. And then, so we need to rely completely on him. You know, so just be careful what you put in your mind. It's not that difficult. Sometimes, you know, you can control some stuff. Sometimes it's out of our control. We live in the world. I mean, they put up billboards of all kinds of disgusting stuff. Maybe start, take a different way home once you figure it out, right? Yeah. You know, what you think. What you, how are you feeding your thoughts? How are you spending your time? You know, and how we respond. One of the things I love about this church is I know people come from far here. 
That's the way it should be. You know, you need to find the best church in your area, even if it's even if it's a drive out. And not only that, you need to support your brothers and sisters in Christ, no matter where they're serving. You know, I love I love this church as much as I love, but I love my church. I love serving at my church, right? But I love like-minded believers. And I like people that are committed to the Word of God. I don't expect you guys to know everything or understand everything that, that I preach today. But do understand that you can get clarity in the Word of God. Because the attacks are coming in tonight. You know, I'm going to, I guess, basically round out this. But there are attacks. and with that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But you need to be careful. You need to guard that mind. And you need to train it. It is a muscle. I think that's why the Bible tells us so much that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, right? And we, we're constantly in this battle. Look, you got to train your mind just like, like if you're going to go into war, you're training yourself. I mean, there's people that spend time. We're in Texas. And, and I mean, I know there's other states that do that, but we're in Texas. But there's, there's a, I have a cousin who does a, a hand training course every weekend. I mean, that guy can like break down a gun and they're constantly training, 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 training. Can you break down your, your Bible, your word? Can you break it down. Can you? Blind. Blindfolded. Can somebody blindfold you and you know how, how this thing works? This is your sword. How are you going to wield it? Are you sharpening that sword? What's safer, uh, Brother Nick? A, a sharp, sharp knife or a dull knife? Sharp. A sharp knife. All I know that, you know, my mom, I remember, did anybody else sell Cutco? Cutco, you never, Cutco, you sold Cutco. I sold Cutco when I was 18. Cutco knives are the best knives, by the way. They really are. It's not a commercial for them. But they're really sharp, and they're really expensive, but they're really sharp. They're really good knives. My mom always grew up with cheapy knives. So when they bought the knives, actually, they told me to warn her, said, be careful, because you're going to cut yourself if you're not careful, because most people are used to cutting the knife. It's dull, so they're you know, putting their, their back into it. And she almost cut her finger off, because she was so used to using a bad, dull knife that she, she went, and all you need with a good knife is just... just you don't even need to exert that much effort, but you got to put effort into sharpening that knife. That's how you got to sharpen your mind. And I guess another title we could have done is sharpening your mind, but you've got to have that checkup from the neck up. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to just be here, uh, to preach your word, Lord, to bring a message that uh, will reinforce what, what we already know, that we have to guard our mind, that we have to guard what we see, what we think, what we do, how we're going to react. And Lord, I have just a, I'm so thankful for pure words and for the members here and how faithful and true they are and how consistent they are, Lord. And uh, just give them the strength and the unction of function and the leadership to go out and do the work that you have set out for them here in 2021. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.